Hi everyone and welcome to week one. This week I would like to talk to you about an introduction to data and refresh your memory on some vocabulary that we are going to need to know for this semester. So first, what is data? Data is facts or values. It's things that we can collect. Information is what we get out of the data. So if data is the fact, information will tell us why that fact is important. So when we are collecting our data, we need to have a way to be able to store it so that we can go through the data to be able to get important information out of it. When we have data, it can be unorganized, doesn't necessarily have context. We can have quantitative or qualitative data. Quantitative data is numerical, so that's things like on a scale of one to five, how much are you enjoying the weather? Whereas qualitative data is descriptive. Please tell me how you feel about the weather today. Information is generally organized in some way, has some variety of context, and can then be used to help make decisions. Now, when we have data, we are generally going to have to store it in some place. When we are storing that data, it actually can become organized, but isn't necessarily useful yet until we actually sort of figure out what we need to ask that data. When we collect our data, we can do manual collections or we can do automatic collections. Um, you'll sometimes see automatic collections like, you know, for example, um, maybe we want to set up a sensor to get a value so that we're not doing it or programming something else to do it. Um, we might end up seeing things like web scraping um, as a way to be able to collect data from other places. We could also manually be collecting data, such as like, you know, surveying people kind of thing. When data is being collected, we have to pay attention to the form that the data is in. So is it quantitative or is it qualitative, numeric or descriptive? Um, and then we have to make sure that if we are collecting data, we have to note the type of data. So if we are, for example, going by and saying, um, you know, hey, what's the temperature today? It's really important that we note is this a Celsius or a Fahrenheit temperature because that can make a really big difference. You know, if somebody says, well, it's 20 degrees out. Well, 20 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Fahrenheit are really different things. Data accuracy is also really important. We never want to make up data. We want to make sure that we are careful to be as accurate as possible when we are collecting and recording our data. So if you are, for example, uh, let's say taking a survey of people. Don't just say, oh, well, I think they said yes. That kind of sounded like a yes. Let's write that down. Make sure that you're confirming. If you aren't sure, make sure that when you're writing things down, you're very careful that you are accurately representing everything that's being said and make sure that when you're collecting your data it's done in the same way. So one of the things that can happen is let's again go back to the survey example. Well the order that you are asking questions might make a difference or the place that you are asking questions might make a difference. The people that you're asking might make a difference. You know um, if we had a survey and we were asking people, um, you know, let's say, for example, how they feel about politics. Well, people directly before an election might feel really differently about politics than they would feel on an off year. Or if they are, for example, holding up signs for somebody that's going into office, they might have much stronger feelings than if you just, you know, let's say walked through a school. Um, so, you know, all of those things are important. Make sure that you have some way of making a note. Make sure that you're asking all of the same questions in the same way to all of the people so that you're making it as accurate and consistent as possible. Um, a more numerical way to look at that is if you've ever tried to measure something, making sure that you are starting your measurement at the same place. So if you're talking about like a ruler or a tape measure, make sure that you're starting it at the same place every time. Otherwise, you'll have problems. 
Okay, structuring your data. When we have data, we want to think of a way to structure it so that everything is in the same order. So let's say, for example, we have a whole bunch of data about books. Well, we want to make sure that we are very clearly noting what is a title, what is an author, what is an editor. Uh, if we're storing things in a spreadsheet, we want to make sure that we know which one's rows, which one col is columns. If we are storing data, we need to make sure that we're labeling it clearly so that we don't accidentally, you know, mix up, let's say, authors and editors. Those are two very different things. Um, you can also do things like specifying the type of data expected. So for example, if we're looking at books and we want, uh, let's say, title, author, year published, well, we might end up wanting to ask for a string, a string, and then an integer. That gives us an extra little fail safe so that if we are putting in when the book was published, we know we're getting, say, an integer. So if somebody tries to put in, you know, when was this book published? Purple. February, you know, none of those are going to work because they aren't integers. They aren't numbers. It's not, you know, 1996 or 2023 or whatever it happens to be. So that's another way that we can make sure that we are getting the correct data in the correct spot. Now, this may seem very silly to you, and you might be sitting there thinking like, oh, well, that's ridiculous. But I would like to just remind you. First off, if you have ever had a job where you had to deal with the public, I think making sure that you're careful how everything is done and labeled should be self-explanatory at this point. Think of the public that you dealt with. Um, but even in a job where we might think like, you know, everybody's actually, let's go out on a limb and say competent, um, there can still be problems. There can still be misunderstandings. There can be assumptions that one person made that somebody else didn't make. There can be all kinds of problems. So it's really important to make sure that everybody's on the same page and there's fail safes wherever possible. When we are storing our data, one way to do that is a database. A database is a collection of organized data. Now, this data is organized, but it hasn't necessarily been turned into information yet. It's easier to store the data in an organized fashion so that we can get to it easier. If we just dump the data like in a pile, it makes it a lot harder to try to sort through it to figure out what we need. Databases can be good for larger amounts of data, but an important note, databases are good for larger amounts of data than say spreadsheets, but once we start getting into gigantic amounts of data, we may end up wanting to go away from the more traditional relational databases. So some examples of where we might use databases. Uh, libraries will use databases for keeping track of books, books that are signed out, books that need to be replaced, uh, books that are getting fixed, books on the shelves, books that need to be shared. Uh, a lot of places will use databases for customers. Uh, some places will use databases for product and inventory. Hospitals will use databases for patient records. Schools will use databases for student records. Um, if you happen to collect anything and your collection gets really large, you might choose to have a database of your collection. Um, we have databases so that we can organize the data more easily and keep larger amounts of it. Yes, technically, so let's, for example, you know, hold on to your disbelief here and pretend I'm a nerd. Um, so let's say I am a huge nerd and I have a large collection of Magic the Gathering cards. Uh, if you don't know what that is, maybe don't get into that hobby. It's expensive. Um, so if I have a large collection of Magic the Gathering cards, yeah, sure, I could put them all in a Word doc, but that's going to get unwieldy really, really quickly. Okay, so now I can put them into a spreadsheet. Well, that's going to be okay, but let's say I start sweeping some tournaments, winning some boxes. You know, it doesn't take that many booster packs before a spreadsheet is just nasty. And then if you have things like you know, books or some cards that will have QR codes and stuff on them, it's actually a lot faster to add them into a database. 
And that also means that you can keep track of more stuff. Like, for example, uh, you know, how much the card is worth is easier to keep track of, the condition that it's in. Um, you can also do a lot more interesting things with it. Like, for example, if you needed to put that card in multiple decks because you wanted to have, let's say, different types of decks and you want to put like um, you know some artifacts in one deck and then have the same artifact be an option in another deck the database would allow you to put those decks together in different ways uh, if you do not like any collectible card games sorry about those last several minutes um, Databases also allow us to store and process our data, but allow other people to add to it as well. So for example, patients in hospitals. Well, all patients are going to have some variety of data about them. It's going to have things like medications, allergies, drug interactions, who they're seeing, when they were last in, what they're coming in for. And if we have all of those things happening, one of the things that's nice about databases is multiple people can add to that patient record. So if you're going in for, say, three different tests in one day, you don't have to wait for each of the people to add them in. They could all add in the test results at the same time and create this centralized location so that everything's going to show up on your patient record and you don't have to worry about things getting overwritten. To get data into a database, you can actually do it in a bunch of different ways. You can do, you know, just general data entry. You can import CSV files. You can um, import other varieties of file types, CSV or comma-separated values is one of the most popular ones, but there's actually a whole bunch. You can also import from other programs, like other database programs, spreadsheet programs, things like that. If you're using SQL, which, spoiler, we'll be using SQL, um, you can do create table and insert to get the data in there. There's also some graphical options or front ends. If you happen to like scripting, you can write a script to enter in your data. So there's lots of different ways we can get data into our database. Databases will look different on different systems. We can have a graphical user interface or GUI. We could also use the command line. Now, this will end up depending sort of who's accessing the database, how they're accessing the database, and the level of comfort that they have with technology. Um, when we're talking about databases, we'll sometimes see these GUI front end options because for a lot of people that makes them more comfortable. They have these little boxes that they type into. They don't have to worry about commands necessarily um, and they can click through things with their mouse. For other people, they might end up wanting to do things like write their own scripts, write their own functions. They're more comfortable on the command line and they know how to use it well so they might want to do the command line option. It's still accessing the same database, it's just doing it in a different way. Now, when we end up having all of these different front end options, the GUI options can actually look surprisingly different from each other. So the different GUIs and dashboards and front end options can look really different, but they will all have the same ability to access the data. There will be different steps that you're doing, but fundamentally you're still working with the same data in the same database backend. The database will save that information to a computer, either your computer or a central computer where that database is. That can be on a server somewhere that the company owns, that can be in the cloud. The uh, front end would then connect to that database so that everybody is on the same page. In a company, a lot of times what you'll have is a few select people are able to change the data, but lots of people will be able to see the data. And some of that's because you have to be really protective over your data. You don't want to accidentally um, lose data, have tables lost, have things get messed up, and that can, you know, little tiny accidents can happen. So it's, it's better if we can avoid them where possible. Some examples of front ends. Um, so some database front ends can be really complex. Some can be 
easier. Some are free, some are not free. Um, another thing that we're starting to see more and more with front ends is actually front ends that are including data analytics and visualizations. So things like Tableau, um, Power BI, Oracle Analytics Cloud, things like that will actually have some analytic options built in where they're trying to use AI to help us be able to do some of the data analysis, asking questions about the data. And some of this can be helpful, cannot be helpful, depends on how it's done. But a lot of it's going to actually come down to how good your data is and how well your data is organized. If you have bad data, you can't save it with analytics because bad data is just bad data. A data dictionary is the explanation of our data. So this is the kinds of data that we have. This is going to be things like notes on the type of information we're saving, how this information was collected. So let's say, for example, the uh, book database. So the data dictionary would have things like, you know, title, author, editor, and then it might have an explanation like, you know, first author goes in author, subsequent authors go in author two. Um, the first 30 characters of title go in title, and anything after that goes in notes. Um, and you can have different things like that so that everybody knows what's going on there. This can also be really helpful if the titles of the columns don't necessarily correspond to what you might think. Now, for books, this is less of an issue. But sometimes you'll see, especially when you get into companies, that a lot of what they're saving, um, there's not really a good way to record that or title it, like, you know, patient data. Okay, cool. But like, we can't just say, you know, patient data or test results or things like that. Some are super obvious, like blood type. Everybody has a blood type. But there are going to be some that are significantly less obvious. And so Having a data dictionary so that we are all on the same page about what's supposed to go in that area is really important. Names are not always obvious. Descriptions can be problematic. So it's important that when we have a data dictionary, we are trying to update it as much as possible. If you're making changes to your database, make sure that you make changes to your data dictionary. Okay, lastly, keys. The reminder on keys primary keys and foreign keys. Primary keys is the unique identifier for each record. Every table has a primary key. It used to be numeric only, is not necessarily anymore. Um, we actually will end up doing something called GUIDs or GUIDs or UUIDs. Um, but the primary key is the unique identifier for each record, has to be unique. The foreign key is the identifier for connecting the primary key to the other table. So every single table has to have that primary key to uniquely identify the record. And then the foreign key is how we can sort of say how this table relationship will end up happening. Some databases will call them both the ID. However, that gets really confusing do not recommend, but that's how we can explain the relationship between the tables. Now, this is in relational databases, which is where we're going to be starting and where we're going to be sort of assuming some things until we get into non-relational databases, which will be noted on that week. So that's the end of week one. Hopefully that was a good reminder or refresher of all of these different topics. And I hope you are all having a lovely day.